Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, too, like the perspective that it gives me. I feel a weird comfort in knowing, in discovering over and over again, that we have always been kind of messed up like this. You know, <laughs> like, like the things that we're looking at right now in 2024 as, you know, terrifying or they feel very new and they feel very urgent and they feel like, uh, you know, we've never, unprecedented. That's a word we hear so much, but it, so few things really are because when you climb through the portal and look through to back in time, and you see those people that lived 100, 200, 300 years ago, and you find that, oh my God, they were fighting about this same stuff then too, or they were having very similar fights and they were having very similar things. And it's like, sometimes we feel like we're on this precipice and that we're about to go over the edge or that this is it. And then you just realize that all, all of humanity has been having a lot of the same discussions and a lot of the same fears. That's Allison Dixon the author and host of the Ding Dong Darkness Time and the Vintage Villains podcast. This is the Silver Linings Handbook podcast. I'm Jason Blair. Allison Dixon has been writing novels and short stories for more than 15 years, and she's the host of the Ding Dong Darkness Time podcast and a new podcast called Vintage Villains. When Allison isn't writing or podcasting, she's usually spending her time focused on thrillers, psychological suspense stories, true crime shows, and interestingly, crocheting something cute or creepy. Allison is the author of several well-reviewed independently published novels, as well as a debut thriller, The Other Mrs. Miller that was picked up by Putnam in the United States and other publishers across the globe. It was published in 2019. Some of her other writing includes The Horror Thriller Strings, a chilling tale of entrapment and greed that makes you question free will as much as a Calvinist would, and the dystopian science fiction novel The Last Supper. Allison was inspired by Gillian Flynn, the screenwriter, producer, and author of thriller and mystery novels, including Gone Girl, a psychological thriller about whether a character named Nick Dunn and whether he was responsible for the death of his wife, Amy. What Allison learned from Jillian's writing is that there's space for realistic and suspenseful fiction writing. She was also inspired by others like Margaret Atwood, the author of The Handmaid's Tale, that Allison said, quote, put her in a state of awe. She also cites Cormac McCarthy, the American novelist who died last year, who was the master of writing graphic novels, plays, and screenplays that Allison says show the power of brevity, a quality I have not quite mastered. I was the guest on a January episode of Ding Dong Darkness Time, where we discuss the cultural phenomenon of the book and the movie Gone Girl, and what we can learn about relationships and societies from the characters and the storyline. I was taken aback by the reaction to the episode and from a movie night we held with our Patreon members, where we watched the movie together. Listeners talked about how the mind-boggling tale of Nick and Amy Dunn in Gone Girl was merely an exaggeration of what happens in our relationships when facades drop and the links that people will go to to avoid feeling trapped and to avoid being abandoned. This is the crux of why this episode is making it into our October episodes. Last year, we did an episode on real-life nightmares like the serial killer Israel Keys with Julia Cowley, the host of The Consult and a former FBI profiler, but serial killers are almost sui generis. We don't meet Ted Bundy, Israel Keys, Joe D'Angelo, Dennis Rader, or any of these people on a daily basis. I was recently looking at someone who made a comment in a Facebook group about how it was a miracle they had not been kidnapped as a teenager because of how much they ran away. No, it isn't. It's a miracle when you're not abused by a family member. It's more miraculous when you don't experience intimate partner abuse. Nearly 3 in 10 women and 1 in 10 men 
experience intimate partner abuse according to a 2010 National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Fewer than 350 people under the age of 21 were abducted by strangers in the United States per year between 2010 and 2017, according to FBI data. That's a one in a million chance. You are much, much, much more likely to be kidnapped by a family member. But the focus of true crime on rare events and the nightmare scenarios that we see in movies and novels, often like Gone Girl, serve as metaphors and exaggerations of what we really fear. Things like loss, a loss of control, a loss of a loved one, a loss of agency, a loss of our younger selves, a betrayal, and a loss of our sense of belonging. Today we're going to discuss how real-life nightmares in the form of psychological thrillers serve as warnings and help us understand our reality. Hey, Allison, I just wanted to thank you for joining. Um, you already know that I have been a huge uh, fan of your podcast for some time. You know, came across them originally, listening to other podcasts, and then became interested in your writing. You know, have read, uh, have read your books. I actually just am recovering from a flood that happened in my apartment, and I found your book, Undamaged. Woohoo! Awesome. <laughs> it was on the floor, but it was undamaged. Um, it was the other Miss Miller, and I thought, okay, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, but you know, one of the things I know, uh, you came on last year, and we talked about a lot of things, including like horror and other things along those lines, and you know, our our shared appreciation for people like Stephen King. And we've had the great opportunity to collaborate talking about Gone Girl earlier this year, but also I've had the chance to be a guest on your new podcast, Vintage Villains. Yes. Well, uh, one of my real life nightmares, Patty Cannon, the mm. slave trader from Maryland. You know, we talked about John Wilkes Booth and Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. We've done a lot of work together since. And I was kind of thinking, like, what are what are some of the things that you unite us. And I think probably looking at the world, probably a little bit for what it is, <laughs> as opposed to what people want it to be might be a theme. I don't know. Right. But anyway. <laughs> That's been part of our discussions. I would definitely agree with that for sure. Um, yeah. I think about that a lot. I think you and I just kind of had this simpatico, like we just sort of, uh, we don't have to talk about, like, we don't often talk about what it is that unites us. We just kind of like, you know, we just had that namaste, you know, or just like. Yeah, I just, I, I've always had this feeling that like, if we had mutual friends and lived in the same town and we're going out with them, yeah. like you and I wouldn't have to talk. We just have to sort of like look at the crazy behavior, look at each other and be like, uh. <laughs> I think that literally describes the first weekend you and I hung out at CrimeCon in Orlando. Yes, so, yes you are. You are correct. <laughs> you are correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, also describes CrimeCon in 2024, too. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it was like game knows game. And we just kind of like, I saw you and I was like, all right, he's someone I need to to bring closer because I just sense that you know how to look at the world and look at the people in it and and, and evaluate it in a in a, a realistic and objective way. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's just, that's something I value in a friend greatly. Yeah. Same way straight there, buddy. Um, <laughs> so, you know, part of the reason why I wanted you to come on last time, last uh, October, since I'm doing, you know, October themed uh, episodes, we talked about our, our broader fascination with darkness. And after your episode, I did an episode with Julia Key, or Julia, excuse me, Julia Keys, poor Julia, with Julia Cowley on Israel Keys. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Julia is a former FBI profiler. And, you know, we were talking about sort of like the myths and the realities of, of Keys. And then 
When we did our episode this year on Gone Girl, one of the things that just really struck me in that conversation was this idea, and I think some of our listeners may have honed in on it before even I did, that in many ways what happened with Nick and Amy Dunn in Gone Girl was an exaggeration of what happens with all of us when we put up a facade in the beginning of a relationship. Eventually it falls down, Mm -hmm. and eventually you know, you end up essentially in a relationship with a person who wasn't really the person you started a a relationship with and all the consequences of that. And I walked away with that feeling like, and you know, it's very interesting. That conversation in January really did affect the rest of my year because in those moments where like, you know, you feel you're going to be abandoned or rejected I felt like it buoyed me. Like I had this gone girl thing in the back of my head that was like, nah, man, just be you. Yeah. Damn the consequences. Just do you. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. And so I, I, it all got me thinking about the fact that like, there are these real life nightmares that we sort of translate into literature. That's just sort of an exaggeration of reality. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about that, this, this time. And, you know, it all brings me back to like a conversation we had about how we, we both love Stephen King and we both love horror, but you didn't think you were going to be a great uh, horror writer. So you turned to psychological thrillers. I, I, I just, I was curious about what that path was like, what resonated with you about psychological thrillers and people like Gillian Flynn and Margaret Atwood and, and just how you how you landed where you are now in terms of your work that's a that's a great question i i think i struggled to stay in the horror space because in a lot of ways um there were a lot of tropes around horror there were a lot of um conventions around horror that kind of maintain that force you to maintain it in this sort of dread space and uh always, always looking to keep people on that sort of like, in that mode of anticipating something awful, like around any corner. And there's not much, not often a lot of room for hope in horror. Not that there's a lot of room for hope in psychological thrillers, but I feel like it just kind of like takes it off like by a couple degrees um, and allows you to meander through a person's um, different personality traits and quirks and play with suspense, but in a way that isn't necessarily um, designed to terrify. But that's a really interesting point because in horror, you know, the psychology of characters does matter, but in, in, in sort of like psychological thrillers, it doesn't just matter. It is it. And what I have always found, even in a scary psychological thriller, trying to understand what's going on, did you ever see like unusual suspects with? Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like Kaiser Sose, like what's going on in your head? Mm. <laughs> and and that becomes like another one for me is if you've ever seen uh Richard Greer and uh Edward Norton in Oh and Primal Fear. Fear. Yeah. yeah. Like I get lost in what's going on in these guys' heads and then kind of lose track of the the gore and the horror and and become much more interested in solving the puzzle. Yeah, exactly. It does. It feels more like a puzzle where horror often just feels like a like a carnival ride um and that can leave you feeling dizzy or nauseous or um something that is, or just screaming your head off. Um you know, I have such a weird relationship with horror as well. It's sort of like a you know, I was exposed to it very early on in my life um, through movies and um, and way too young, probably younger than I would have recommended or even allowed for my own kids. But I was about six, seven, eight years old watching, you know, Friday the 13th or um, Freddy Krueger, you know, and all these, and you know, Michael Myers and all these guys. And uh, the way that that sets into a kid's brain, it, it becomes both something that traumatizes you, but also becomes a part of you. And so I find that I don't watch a lot of horror, although I do still aim for the darkness at the same time. I, it's just a weird thing where I'm both repulsed by it and attracted to it. And so I just, um, I try to incorporate little aspects of it into what I do. 
Um, but I have to make it so I can live there. And so uh, Strings, my book Strings was a kind of an exception to that rule just because it was in this constant, I was always like striving to make that book as like awful as possible and in, in the best way, hopefully. But I mean, <laughs> I was just really trying to outdo myself at every turn with that book just to terrify people. But that's not where I want to be, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking recently about my three favorite Stephen King books. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting because it makes me think that like, I, it, it just makes sense when, when you think about the fact that in the, this part of my life, I'm focused on psychology and mental health and, and the way people tick and stuff like that. Yeah. But they were fire starter. Mm, right? Yeah. Realistic kind of M MK ultra type, um, <laughs> type secret CIA program, all of which were probably true, except for they just, you know, telekinesis and fire starting instead of uh oh, like on acid. Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> and then the pet cemetery, obviously, yeah. which so much is about the psychology of like the danger of not letting go. Like, yes. Very yeah. well said. Yeah. Please do not yes, do not bury your uh loved one in the pet cemetery because they're not coming back. Right. Um and then the stand. Oh, so, yeah. like the stand, perhaps my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was always drawn, I, I realized to both psychological thrill, but also sociological thrill. Yeah. And, and I, you know, so when I went through Stephen King's books, like Carrie and uh, Christine, also very, very scary books that had lessons you know, whether it was about bullying or it was about other things like that, they had, they had lessons built into them, important ones for me as a young person. Yeah. Learn I, the line between what was a psychological thriller and a horror for me was very thin. Like, you know, a book like The It, there's a lesson in there, but it's really horror. But then a book like Stan, there's a, there's a lesson for all of society in that. And I, I wonder, how do you differentiate the difference between a uh, psychological thriller and horror, or do they always have a little of the same thing in them? They definitely can. I mean, y y you can absolutely have, uh, it, it's funny we heard, you asked me this question because I get this um, comment from a lot of editors that I've submitted my work to, um, especially in New York, uh, where they're much more interested in commercial thriller than they are ever going to be in horror, um, sadly, because it's just not where the money is for the audiences. And they always accuse me of putting too much horror in my psychological thriller. And I think it is ultimately about how much you're willing to ratchet up someone's adrenaline level and make them experience something visceral. And I think that once you pass a certain threshold of viscerality in a psychological thriller, it can start to verge into a horror place. And I'll, I'll give you a more concrete example. I wrote a book that has yet to be uh, published yet, but I'll give the basic strokes of it. It is a it's about a group of moms who um, met online. They're a little mom group and they get together once a year for a little mom's retreat. And while they're on that retreat, they commit you know, a this, Oh, well, I was about to say until the murder, this sounded a lot like the Mormon mom talk scandal. But yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a little, yeah, but I figured, oh, so what they're doing is sort of like a vigilante kind of justice killing, you know, they'll, um, find someone that they know is a is a bad guy and they'll take him out. And that's just part of their um, yearly retreat. Um, and then and within the course of the book, um, bad things start happening to them and they end up kind of, it becomes this cabin in the woods setup where someone is taunting them and stalking them and making them afraid of the, for their lives. Mm. And that's when the editor was like, this is turning into a horror story because there you have your little setting um, of the isolated cabin with the bad things happening and a bad guy running around who might be a killer. And that started to verge into horror for them and it took it out of the thriller context. And so 
I think there's something in that mix there where, and I do tend to agree. I just didn't think there was anything wrong with that uh, because I think a lot of the people who appreciate psychological thriller will appreciate horror stories. Maybe not all of them, but uh, yeah. Aren't they, aren't they though, aren't psychological thrillers just like, aren't they really horrors that, aren't as supernatural or where the bad guy isn't just like impossible. Like, you know, I think about, I think, I think about horror stuff I've seen this year, like Abigail. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I really actually enjoyed that one. And and, and there are people too. And I, you bring up a good point, by the way, when you said the word supernatural, there is a very strong argument out there among certain horror fans that horror is supernatural in basis. I completely disagree with that. I could write a very long dissertation on why I disagree with that. Um, but I think that is also part of it. If you can start to like think that there is something otherworldly going on in the story that is scary, then that puts it into horror immediately for people. Like Stephen King will often um, diverge into the supernatural with a lot of you know, his horror stories like Pet Cemetery, for instance, you have, well, obviously, <laughs> you know, the dead coming back to life and he's being visited by a ghost. And, you know, there's other things that happen. The Shining is another example. Uh, there's a, a very supernatural horror story. Um, or he'll also just insert little moments of like telekinesis or telepathy or something like that within the context of the story where it otherwise isn't there. You know what? I lied because I said those are my three f- favorite books. Those are my three favorite Stephen King early books. My actual favorite Stephen book, Stephen King book, is The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Oh, that is where, such a good story. But you don't okay. have an inch of supernatural thing mm-hmm. into the last scene. It's almost like comedic. And a supernatural creature pops out. And it, and it felt like it was appropriate just because by that point, that poor girl was going through a psychological break practically. And it almost made you wonder if it was a hallucination on her part. Um, I love that book, um, mostly because I love any story that pits the protagonist against nature in any way, shape or form, you know, even going back to, um, oh, who's the guy who wrote all the stories in the, in the Yukon. Um, and like, oh, I can't remember his name offhand, uh, Jack something. Oh my gosh. She writes, writes a lot of wilderness stories. I used to, I like call of the wild. That was the name of, of one of the books. Um, it was about a, you know, somebody surviving out in the wilderness and there's wolves and that he befriends out there and stuff. So I love anything that involves, uh, a struggle against nature. And I feel like that story just really, uh, it was quite perfect. It's a it's a perfect little story. Um, Are you talking about the Jack London book? Jack London, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, so even going back as far as that, just reading those in middle school. Um, but yeah, uh, my favorite Stephen King books, um, in particular, Pet Cemetery. You mentioned one is probably one of my, is probably my favorite horror, strong horror of his. But probably my other big favorite is not quite, but almost horror is eleven twenty two sixty three. Um, which is about the Kennedy assassination, but he incorporates an element of time travel into it um, where the protagonist goes back in time to carry out the Kennedy assassination or to stop the Kennedy assassination rather. Um, And so he incorporates history into the story um, as well as some weird, um, interesting little sci-fi speculative fiction elements. Um, So that's that book of his really ties together so many things I love about all literature into one perfect epic historical like horror story. Um, so I highly recommend that one. So you so but I, I forget our episode aired in early October, the one on darkness. And um, my mom died in uh, the end of October of last year. And at her funeral, um, it was very funny. I made no references to literature except for one. And 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 someone actually grabbed me about the reference afterwards, but I I, I went through this part of the uh, my remarks where I was talking about these key people who really were important in in me and my brother's lives, and I realized as I got older and took on more responsibility and you know had kids in my own life that uh, part of the reason why my mom brought these people 
into her life or valued them so much was that she knew they would be there for her sons afterwards. So anyway, in the, in the remarks, I talk about, I, I, I speak directly to those people about how they've been there for us and how they comforted my mother because she knew um, that they would, that they would be there for us when she was gone. And, you know, I credited the, them with doing that and, I then went to talk about my mom and how she was there through our darkest times and how she didn't judge me and how she lifted me up, right? And and that these people were the people who they knew would make uh, her son, make sure her son was okay. And I talk about how I felt lost and lonely in life and how I was telling a friend recently, right before then about the book, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, and, you know, I told the audience that it's a, you know, a girl who was lost in the woods, who found comfort in loneliness and triumphed through adversity, through listening to her favorite baseball player, Tom Gordon, mm-hmm. play on the radio through her Walkman. And I let the audience know, I was like, you guys are all my Tom Gordon, right? Yeah. And you can't imagine the comfort that. I get from being able to listen to them metaphorically through the Walkman. And so I I bring this all up to say Stephen King wrote a book about a girl walking through the woods that, you know, 20 years later, Jason Blair sitting at his mom's funeral, it resonates with him so much because the thing that the girl and the girl who loved Tom Gordon experienced that's universal was the suffering that comes from loneliness and feeling yeah. alone. And, you know, what's the likelihood that I'm going to get lost in the woods listening to my baseball player and then run into a supernatural monster? Probably fairly low. However, the likelihood of feeling loneliness, you were saying. I mean, you you really laid out beautifully sort of what King does. And when I think any author who tries to write a, a fiction, a good fiction story, is he has that beautiful double meaning. You know, you have the literal meaning of the story, the plot and everything. And then you have that underlying thing. And I have no doubt that that theme was probably in my head. I can't remember what year that book was written. I want to say it was must have been about 2009, 2008, somewhere around there. But um, that theme that you talk about, about that loneliness and that thing that she had, that North Star that she could just hold on to, that could guide her out and help get you through the really difficult times. I relate to that so very much, probably with the same people and the same friends and the same voices um, as well that I latched on to during my darkest times, which is how I kind of am in podcasting right now. Um, because that's so important. And, um, and I really love, um, that particular element. I wrote a, I wrote a story some years ago called dust about, um, a man, uh, the world is basically, um, being taken over by this, uh, moon dust, essentially come back from this moon mission. And there's this carnivorous, like they found the dust on the moon, like eats everything. And it made it back to Earth and it just starts consuming the planet and the planet is slowly being converted to gray dust. And it's told from the point of view of this man living in a bunker that he had built when his daughter um, died in 9-11. And he he built this terrorist proof sort of bunker and he spent every penny he had and he was all alone. And it, And he ends up being the only man left in the world. And he always thought of himself as this re- self-reliant individualist person that could survive on his own if he had to, but he didn't realize as time was going on how much he needed that human connection. And so at the very end, he... I do it to survive without anyone is to not survive. Exactly. And you want that, you want someone to bear witness. You want someone to hold your hand or just be that sort of that to for you to know, like I am here, um, and he has a little bit of that toward the end of the story, and I and I was like, there's something about that theme that's so universal for human beings. It doesn't matter how solitary you think you can be as a person, we still need each other, especially through the nightmares. <laughs> so right, right, yeah. Well, and and that's also like a part of it. And thinking about horror, and King's always. Is I, I always found was different because 
despite what people think, King always ends on an optimistic note, except for maybe with Pet Cemetery. That might be the exception. But yeah. <laughs> he always does. But, you know, like, it's this idea in writing, whether it's, and I don't know if life is like this, but I feel like life is like this in a series, a nonstop series of something being taken away from us, a sense of safety, a sense of belonging, a sense of whatever. And in that suffering we go through, we learn its value. So the next time it's given back to us, um, we appreciate it or have, excuse me, have the opportunity to appreciate it more. I mean, that's why I think horror as a genre is so valuable. And I get a little, I get a little irritated by people who dismiss it outright, um, you know, because there are different grades of it. It isn't all, it isn't all shock and gore and gratuitous torture or anything like that. It's, it, there are different types. And, but I find that it, it, ha it serves the purpose of allowing us to use our empathy to watch someone go through something very harrowing. And then we can sort of afterwards have that reflection period um, on ourselves and our own place in the world. And we can sort of feel a little better about it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so I find that it's quite a valuable thing. I want to jump back to something that you said. You, you'd said like that it's very helpful for you in your darkest uh, times. And you said that's sort of like what you're going through in podcasting right, right mm -hmm. now. But I was going to ask about that, but also ask about how, how is it helpful in the darkest times? Well, you know, I think, you know, you mean in terms of podcasting? No, just in general. Just in general. I mean, I find, uh, I find it very helpful to know that I have the opportunity to connect with someone else that could be going through things that I've been through. Like that has always been the thing that carries me through. Um, being able to make a connection, even if I don't meet that person, just putting We're doing that because that's my whole brand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really why I think it's really why I love your podcast because it, I get that out of every discussion you have with different people is uh, that thing that kind of brings us in all together and, and unites us. And um, when I put stories out there, when I put podcasts out there, it's really like I think about the times that I needed those things and I want to be able to put those things out there for people the same way. Um, sort of like a, a, like, I don't know, um, leaving, uh, leaving a coin in a wishing well or leaving a, you know, leaving someone there for someone else, uh, whenever they come along. Um, yeah. It's like paying it forward, passing it along, throwing right. the baton, pick whichever metaphor you want to use. Yeah. Or like what they call a, a trail magic, uh, which is what a lot of people who hike, they hike the Appalachian trail. Um, the people who hike the Appalachian trail talk about how, you know, they leave snacks or they leave um, little mm -hmm. little notes or they leave little things behind for the other hikers to come across because it's such a long and lonely hike that when you find those little pieces on the trail, it makes you feel connected to people and you don't feel as lonely anymore. And I think we just are doing some form of that mm. um, in life. That's a way. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to think of it. Yeah. So you know, back in January when we did that episode on Gone Girl, um, you know, I, I kind of talked about what some of my takeaways were. I was going to ask you just sort of a little bit about what your takeaways uh, from the book were, the movie, and the reaction of our listeners. And, you know, just to sort of like give the plot summary – you know, Nick and Amy Don, they become married. Like in the beginning, we think, because it's really hard, we have an unreliable narrator in Amy for much of the book. But, you know, we think Nick, you know, puts on a front. Her parents put on a different kind of front. She puts on a front. And they end up in this relationship that uh, it, it, it's so abusive, it's hard to even tell who's abusive in the situation. But at its core, you know, Amy does some really crazy things, including framing, it appears, frame, 
because I'm just gonna I'm gonna hesitate on everything about this book. Right. It appears to be framing Nick for her murder. Um, you know, Nick, who's having an affair and is hiding all these things from Amy and feels tortured, is also doing this this you know untoward uh, stuff toward her. And you know, I just did not expect our listeners, our viewers, and our communities to, um, for it to resonate with them the way that it did. And it was really interesting to me to see how in both the public discussions and then private discussions I had with people, uh, they were able to relate this wild story about Nick and Amy to real things in their lives. Oh, yeah. So I wonder what your takeaways were from it. Oh my gosh. I, I was the same way. I mean, I, um, I've always felt very connected to that story because I love the exploration of facades just in general, because we all have them, whether we think we do or not, we all have a different mask in some form that we wear at different times for different occasions. And, um, and we do it on social media. Every one of us does Shop Macy's VIP sale going on now. Use your coupon or Macy's card and take an extra 30% off the latest fall trends from designers that rarely go on sale. And save 15% off skincare, makeup, fragrances, and more. Plus, shop fall specials for even more great deals on top brands at Macy's. Savings off regular and already reduced prices. Exclusions apply. some form of this on social media where we put out the best of ourselves. Um, we put the best. Oh, it's so funny you say that. I'll, I'll buy the facade part, but not always the best of us because it's very funny. And I was recently having a conversation with somebody who follows me on Twitter. And, you know, it's a friend of mine. They follow me on Twitter. And they're like, you have a very snarky Twitter personality. I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> And so I'll see your snark and raise you like 50 yes. snarks. My right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yes. Right. My <laughs> snark on Twitter is a very diplomatic, <laughs> yeah. very, very polite snark. Um, but my Facebook personality is like all roses and sunshine and happiness, unless you want to like argue some logical, logic thing with me. But, um, but you know, I, I, what I realized in having this conversation was like, and my Instagram personality is all pretty pictures and stuff that I like that's art, artistic. And it made me think of the fact that it, beyond social media, that we as humans put on different fronts for different audiences based on, I think, to some extent, some of it's authentic, right? Like I yeah. think of Instagram personality is the part of me that loves beauty. The Twitter personality is the part of me that cares about logic. But, and, and there's some reality to them. Yeah. Uh, but there's also some, it's driven by the sociological factors of each of those groups. It's driven by the tools we're given. How do we know when the facade crosses the line into being inauthentic. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, that's a that's a dang good question. Um and you know as I said dang because I'm wearing my facade of not swearing because I'm on a guest I'm a guest on somebody else's show. See, and that's that's the thing <laughs> is cuz you know me my friend. Um I don't often hold back on that. Um but that's a very good question and I think that is something that has to be only really answerable by the person wearing it, right? Because they have to know when they take that mask off at the end of the day, whether or not they were lying, um, you know, to a certain extent. Because like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, whenever I'm in my professional mode or semi-professional mode, like right now, or if I'm on a Vintage Villains episode, I'm not usually dropping F-bombs on that show either. Um, but I'm still me, but I also know that I've been in situations where I start to feel inauthentic. And it's usually like if I'm in a group situation and, and I'm not in con complete control of it, I'm just along for the ride and I just have to put on a smiling face and pretend like I'm having a good time. Um, and when I'm you, actually dying inside, and that happens every so often. And uh, and I think that anybody who's ever like been through something like that can sort of like go, 
you know, at the end of it, they're like, man, I am, I'm so tired and I'm just, um, you know, I can't carry this on anymore. I don't want to do that again. And so that, that for me is like, uh, that's how, you know, I think is, is how it's making you feel, but that is also assuming you are not maybe a psychopath because in the instance of Gone Girl, uh, with Amy and Nick, I mean, these two guys and this guy and this gal are, completely BSing themselves and everybody around them in in so many different ways that I don't even know if they know who they are anymore. And I think that's what really gets uh, to the disturbing element of that story is, and it upsets the reader because you get only, you get about halfway through that book and everything you thought you know completely gets turned on its head about these people. And I have this friend and when I first became friends with her, like one of the things I always noticed, she always was smiling, always smiling, always smiling in person, always smiling on her social media. And then we started playing this game as we got to know each other because you get to know anyone, you know, they're not always smiling where I would guess whether she was actually happy in the picture <laughs> she would, where she was smiling. And, I, you know, it didn't bother me because she was self-aware, right? Like she knew she knew how she really felt. She, her facade hadn't taken over. And, and there was like an intentionality to it. Like, and she once put it this way. She's like, the people who are on my Facebook, this is what they can handle. Mm-hmm. Like, Ooh. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, yeah. Like, and she said, like, if they see how sad I am, they're going to rush to my aid. They're going to worry. And that's not going to do anybody any good. And I thought to myself, wow, like that's well learned um, and thoughtful. But I also see another version of it where a person could say, well, I'm smiling simply to project this image. Um, and if you're doing that to project that image, maybe you're attracting the wrong people. Very and I even true. think about that with my friend, like, it, was she attracting people to her who were Pollyanna and maybe that was a good thing for her or was, was she attracting people who would never really be able to help her because they're, you know? So anyway, that I think the motive of your facade, I guess that's the way I'm getting. That's true because there are some people that do put it out there to look like they are, let's say more financially better off than they actually are or, or professionally like um, higher standing than maybe they actually are. It's more like a they don't like what they see in the mirror every day whenever they have to live inside their own bodies. And so they have to project this image that is so much more saturated and enriched than than it might be, at least to them. You know, they're they're sort of performing to a certain extent. And I don't you can kind of tell, I think we've all been on social media long enough now. Like when it was a new thing, I feel like we were all probably doing that to a certain extent. Um, but now that Facebook has been around for God, like almost 20 years now, um, I've been on it since 2007. I feel like um, we can now kind of like spot that or you see that in sort of influencer culture, right? You see it, you know, the perfect mom or what they're calling now the trad wife um, a phenomenon where it's like this perfect wife in this very domestic, tranquil setting, making like beautiful pies and having her life together and everything's perfectly organized and people watch this content and aspire to it, not realizing it is engineered product, that there is a producer behind the scenes of all this, that it is a a business. But people look at this and they go, oh, I want my life to be like that. Well, nobody's life is like that. So that's what we're seeing now. Um, so there is that kind of facade. And I think that also kind of applies to maybe a little bit of like Nick and Amy and Gone Girl, where they are putting on this facade, like we are this beautiful, attractive couple that are, you know, we have money and we have our lives together and all this. And, you know, when she goes missing, that gets even more amplified. She's the the pretty girl who lights up the room and, you know, becomes that classic missing girl um, thing that we see in real life. Um, as well. Uh, an interesting point that I, I wasn't thinking about from the perspective of we could all relate to putting on a facade. Mm-hmm. We could all relate to becoming lost and unhappy in that facade. And we could all relate to the, you know, like Amy's fear of being abandoned by Nick causing her to do really crazy things 
like at first trying to control him, it seems. Yeah. Um, and then eventually faking her death and framing him. And we could all relate to Nick's sense of like not wanting to be controlled and not wanting to be trapped. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there are there. Are, and also thinking of Amy, her parents turned her into a product as a child. They made themselves rich off of idealizing their daughter in this fictional form, this amazing Amy character in this series of books that they wrote. And that's the daughter they were raising was the fictional daughter. And I would not, see like, not the daughter that was really in front of them. Right. The daughter that was withering away in front of them and turning into this kind of a resentful, hateful person that she was keeping that under wraps for a very long time. And the way that um, Gillian Flynn sort of welcomes the reader into that psyche in the second half of the book is honestly, that I think that's more terrifying than a lot of horror that I've read. Um, and in way one of the you know, scariest things about that book, now that I listen to what you're saying, mm-hmm. actually, now that I think about it, and this is the first time I thought of it, is no one in that book is being loved for who they are, mm-hmm. except for maybe Nick's sister knows him and loves him for who he is. But with the exception of her, I'm not sure anyone in that book is being loved for who they are. No, no. And Amy, I think least of all, I think it's also because Amy, I don't know that Amy really knows who she is, you know, in that, in that book, because it, it, what, what I find interesting it's is the point, maybe there never was an Amy, just the, why, you know, like the shell of an Amy and that the, that was just so disrupted by the character that her parents created. She loved being, when it was good with Nick, she loved being the the cool wife, the wife that was taking care of him, who was being adored um, by Nick because she thought that he could see everything about her. And when it came that he was seeing sides of her, that she when she was letting parts of herself out and he was seeing those and he was not reacting positively to them, then in her brain, she was going, oh, you don't really love the real me at all. And then she turns on him. And so, uh, and then he goes and has an affair. And I think that just, well, of course, sends it right down the tubes because, you know, what is the basis of a lot of marital affairs, unfortunately, is when when things get real because the honeymoon period ends, the the shininess rubs off the penny over over time. That's just what time does. We see each other in less than perfect circumstances um, when we're sick or when we're injured or when we're desperate and sad and depressed, you know, those kind of things. And there are people that just, you know, when that shine rubs off, they just start looking for another shiny coin instead of kind of appreciating the tarnish, you know? Uh, and so the relationships that tend to last are the ones that see you see the tarnished uh, finish on one another. And these two guys, this these two people in this story just could not quite do that. Um, I, was, I was talking to a friend who's a psychologist earlier this year, and we were talking about the blessings and the curses of being in a psychological field. And one of the blessings I was telling her is, well, when you start a new relationship and everything's good, there are these little tells that tell you what this person is like at their worst. And I'm like, one of the really great things about that is if you like really care about somebody or you've become a close friend of theirs or you love them, um, you're able to say to yourself, okay, this is probably what this person is going to be like at their worst, right? This thing you have imagined in your head. And you're like, I can live with that. Or on the other hand, you're like, this is what this person is like at their worst. They have done absolutely nothing. There is no way I can live with this. So like the curse of it is we're constantly like, you know, starting relationships with people, whether it's friends or dating relationships. And we're like, yep, nope. (laughs) Everyone's like, why are you like, yep, nope. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm knowing a year from now, not not right. But (laughs) the upside of it, I, I was saying to her is that like, you know, you can love somebody for who they are, even the person they haven't showed you. Mm-hmm. So when you tell them that you love them and then they go do that absolutely insanely crazy thing that they think is going to cause you to abandon them, you're able to be like, yeah, I already knew. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I tell you what, as someone who came into like my marriage is, is I mean, you know, my language is a little rough here, but as sort of crazy, um, you know, because I was quite young, I was 20 years old and still kind of working out the kinks and in, in the old brain there um, <laughs> and becoming who I was. Uh, the fact that I was able to be that sort of uh, impetuous, impulsive and kind of, um, you know, a lot more uh, moody um, than I than I currently am, if you can believe that, um, you know, in that he stuck by me. And then I, he said, he said something once and like we were in the midst of a fight and he was like, you seem to think that I'm, I'm going to stop loving you because of mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. And when it was in, when he had to like spell out, he was like, that's not how it works. And it's quieted the thing in my brain that was literally thinking he's going to stop loving me because of this. Yeah, And it was like something I needed to hear because it was something I'd never heard before in my life, honestly. I mean, I'd never heard that from a partner. I'd never heard that really from a friend, not in those exact words. Maybe it had been expressed. It was just something I'd never picked up on. Yeah. Um, and and I tell you, it sort of changed me in a big well, way. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah, and I no. If somebody had said that to to either of these two, you know, maybe none of this stuff wouldn't have happened in Gone Girl. You know? Or or the other piece of it, you know, I'd say like your husband and I probably share something in common in that sense because I've been on the other side of the actual that literal conversation where I've yeah. been like, I'm not sure. I mean, like where I'm like, are you trying to like figure out a way to break my love? Because yeah, like, um, right. <laughs> yeah, but like maybe it's one thing when you have people like that and they show you that, but what happens, and this is where I think it comes back to Gone Girl, when the other person, if they they never really wanted the real you. Yes, and that's the heartbreak, right? That's um, the scary. Yeah, that's not the yeah. part, but one of the scary. Okay, because if you are someone, say, like Amy, who is a very crafty manipulator um, who had been, had a history of, uh, you know, manipulating and stalking and doing kind of terrible revenge things to people who um, abandoned her, like her best girlfriend, I think from like high school or something like that or college. I can't remember Um, right now. It's sort of like, you know, but she was like abandoned very, or felt abandoned very early on by her parents and, you know, ignored by them and everything. So it really, I think that fear of abandonment and that fear of like, what if they see the real me and they don't like me? I've already been rejected by my parents. So of course, anybody else is probably going to reject me. I think that's probably at the center. You're the mental health guy, but I mean, that seems to be sort of at the center. I think of a lot of people that have that a cluster B attachment, you know, issue of like, they're going to abandon me. Fear of abandonment, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, Amy is like the textbook. You know, it's funny because you're you're kind of right. Like if you bucket together sort of like borderline personality where you have this fear of real or imagined abandonment or a histrionic personality where like if I'm colorful enough, if I'm Mm. outgoing (laughs) enough, if I'm seductive enough, you'll love me. With a sociopath who's like, uh, you're not going to love me anyway, so I'm going to just charm you and manipulate you so you do what I want. Like, And same thing with the narcissist where it's like strong enough if I put on this facade of being strong or all these other things, like all of them really are about fears of being abandoned. Yeah, and isn't it interesting too that that becomes such a common use and trope and stories, especially about relationships. Uh, If you're looking to write a story about a really messed up relationship, that tends to be the centerpiece in a lot of ways. The uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual on Mental Disorders section on personality disorders, go to Cluster B if you're not author and start writing yeah i mean geez go watch fatal attraction i mean that's a, like another i almost feel like fatal attraction kind of walked so everyone else could run with these stories you know <laughs> like um i will not be ignored you know um boiling rabbits on his stove you know that kind of thing so i think that that is such a shared human experience and and you know we were i think in your um notes you know you'd mentioned another very similar story of a girl on the train 
by uh, Paula Hawkins. And, yep. you know, it plays on a sort of a similar trope, a very different story in, in some respects. But this is another trope that we see a lot with female led uh, or sorry, woman led uh, stories about uh, broken marriages or abandonment is there. I think Amy, I can't remember if she was a drinker. But a lot of the women in these stories are alcoholics. And Paula uh, Hawkins wrote, you know, her main character was very much an alcoholic. Um, the story, The Woman in the Window, is another very similar um, domestic thriller um, with a alcoholic woman protagonist um, who is dealing with sort of the end of her marriage and all the thing in family and everything that went wrong there. The thing is, a lot of people call these tropes, I just called it a trope. But it's a trope for a reason. I think it's kind of a, again, a very shared human experience of, you know, adding substance abuse to that. Equation. Yeah. And then, you know, like, it's funny. I was going to jump back to one thing you said about, um, you mentioned fatal attraction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, so Glenn Close's character is the woman with the affair. And she, one time she comes in uh, to the house and she's boiling right? The daughter's bunny or the kid's yeah, bunny? The, yeah, the daughter's pet rabbit. Yeah. So insane, right? Like mm -hmm. 100% way out there insane. But how many times do I end up in conversations where I'm saying to someone, you better look out or that person's going to boil your bunny? I mean, like, <laughs> it is a metaphor that comes up in conversations. Like, you know, I, I literally said to someone a couple of weeks ago, have you done a head count on your bunnies? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that is part, it is interesting because it, yeah, it is, it's where a story becomes the touchstone for a, a human experience that is relatable to us all, even though it feels hyper real, right? Because who, who knows anybody that that's actually happened to, or for instance, who knows? I mean, I know there have been stories about like, um, a Gone Girl scenario, like Sherry Papini being um, the one that comes closest to mind where she disappeared herself for a bit and her husband, you know, an attempt to frame her husband or whatever. But in reality, a lot of these stories are very exaggerated. They don't happen this way. You know, Girl on the Train, that scenario is ridiculous in a lot of ways. But in the core of it is like part of, again, that relatable human experience of loss and need, like human need for love and and contact. Um, and I think that's why that genre is so popular with uh, a lot of women, actually. A lot of women in domestic situations that have young children and they are often newly married or in new relationships. I mean, the demographic of people that read these stories are usually women who are in their own domestic situations. And maybe they feel a little trapped, but not like that. So they'll read a domestic story about someone who's in a way worse situation. And they go, well, okay, my life might be a little boring. And maybe I have to do laundry every day. But, you know, for the most this part. This isn't that bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in Girl on the, the Girl on the Train, you know, uh, Rachel is the, I think she's in recovery at the beginning of the book. But she's the alcoholic and she is driving mindlessly from like, I don't know, it's somewhere in Westchester County to New York city and back and forth on the train. And one of the sort of like themes of her thinking that is very clear is all of her regret. She yes. has regret for her marriage falling apart. She believes that it was her behavior, like at a holiday party for her work that contributed to him losing his job. Like, she holds herself responsible for everything. And I, I think that that's almost a, a very relatable thing for all of us when, well, not all of us, because there are narcissists, but <laughs> for many people that when something goes wrong, we, you know, whether you're naturally self-aware and vigilant and you go in and you, you know, worry about and regret your past mistakes just as a natural part of your personality, or you're not, but you're smart enough to know that you need to, we, we begin to sort of like build this myth that we're responsible for everything 
bad that mm. happened as opposed like the options are either they are all responsible or I'm completely responsible instead of the 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 more likely reality that both people play some role in any human connection failing and then as uh she starts to sort of recover her memories Rachel realizes that or it's not the recovering the memories she talks to somebody from her ex-husband's work who's like Oh no 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 no! He didn't he didn't get fired because of anything you did. He got fired for sexual harassment. She's yes. Like, wait, a wait a minute! Everything that I thought about myself and was beating up about myself may not be true. And then that leads to her realizing, oh shoot, my ex husband did kill this woman who is his neighbor. But in that core idea that of living that nightmare of living in a world where you think you firmly believe you're responsible for things that you may not be, I find both both frightening and also totally relatable. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of gaslighting going on from Tom with her, too, because he was feeding into that. Like, you're a drunk, and you did this, and you did that, and because you're a drunk. And that's really what it became about. And, of course, you know, she starts, you know, and the way the book, by the way, paints her alcoholism is very brutal to read, especially if you've ever had a drinking problem. Um, you know, and and so that I have to give props to that because she didn't make the alcoholism attractive. Um, like a like you tend to see in a lot of stories featuring women in like soap operas where they're just tipping a little bottle of wine into their glass and drinking it demurely. Um, no, Rachel was just, she guzzled that stuff, man. And, you know, she was a binge drinker and, you know, being in that vulnerable situation where you know that you are in diminished capacity and you're not in your best, um, your best mind and you're not making the best choices because of the drinking that well, and also that. he saw you, that and capitalized on it though. You also you know? don't have clear memory. And so right. that's another piece. Mm -hmm. So when you are an active alcoholic in a relationship or a drug addict, you rely on other people to fill in the gaps. Yes. And some yeah. people will fill in the gaps with the truth, and some people will fill in the gaps with a modified version that serves them well. Oh, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah. So here, a, a, one fascinating thing that I've found uh, in, in, in work in mental health, that people coming out of recovery, one of the most difficult things is for the person who is supporting them most, particularly if it's their intimate partner, to transition from uh, caretaker mode to equal partner mode. Mm -hmm. And it is really rough. It's hard to tell when. Um, most people have just very practical ideas, uh, problems around like what you, what you need for me. But there's a handful of people, they may have built resentment. They may have, um, you know, they just may not be good people. Right. That, that will kick that person who no longer is needy to the side. But it can create for the person who's in recovery, you have this real blindness to what was me and what was them and what was circumstance. Yeah. And it's really, really fuzzy. And I think there's something frightening that can happen to people whenever they live in a or in a situation that's being clouded. You mentioned the word gaslit. Um, but 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 that idea that we make it so black and white, right? Like it's all me, it's all them, it's right. all on the blank. But the thing about the girl on the train is obviously a lot of it is Rachel. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Shop Macy's VIP sale going on now. Use your coupon or Macy's card and take an extra 30% off the latest fall trends from designers that rarely go on sale. And save 15% off skincare, makeup, fragrances, and more. 
Plus, shop fall specials for even more great deals on top brands at Macy's. Savings off regular and already reduced prices. Exclusions apply. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. And yeah. a lot of it is Rachel and her drinking. Yeah. She believed it was all her. <laughs> I remember talking to this friend last year. And uh, it was a relatively new friend, and she was telling me about one of her past relationships. And he was very, very abusive in a lot of different ways. And like it was, it was, it was. There were just uh, horrifically emotionally abusive. Toward the end of one period, it started to get physically abusive, and it was really bad. And it was very funny. I remember her saying at the end, and I, I thought this was so cool. And she's at the end of this whole like three hour conversation about her relationships we're randomly talking about. And then she stops and she's like, and don't get me wrong. I sparked a lot of it. <laughs> and she then just starts to go into like the things that she did to set things off. And I was like, huh? No, oh, this is a really well-rounded person I'm talking to right now who sees, who sees that Satan walked in the door in the form of this dude. But yeah. she also holds herself a little bit responsible for it. I was like, that was a nice balance. Because I mean, for most of us, if Satan walks in the door, it's all Satan's fault. That's so true. And I tell you, I mean, the, you know, having had my own drinking problem that I've recovered from, I can absolutely say that the the feeling of like knowing that once I got past a certain number of drinks, that I just kind of became I wouldn't say a completely different person, but a lot of my least favorite characteristics would emerge, um, usually just being very like emotionally like modeling um, for lack of a better word or sort of like weirdly dependent and insecure, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that feeling of like, no one's ever going to love me, you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of those things come out when you're uh, do, when you're drinking a lot and um, that feeling of like waking up in the morning and having to check my phone immediately to make sure that I did not send some drunken confessional to somebody in at two o'clock in the morning while I was completely loaded. Um, you know, that, that kind of like. I'm so glad that the bulk of my drinking was pre-text message. Oh my God. I wish that I could say that. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and the, That's me. There, there's some wild answering machine messages that are probably still out there. When you, when you put yourself in that situation of sort of removing your higher faculties on a regular basis and you are, uh, with someone that, you know, maybe that's not the most honest and healthy relationship. And there becomes that weird codependency that happens where, you know, they become dependent on your kind of incapacitation to be able to do some of their manipulation and get some things out of you that they want. And you're dependent on them because you know, you're this drunken fool that is nobody without them and you'll do anything to hold on to them. And you just end up in this like messy, you know, you're victimizing each other, you know, over and over and over again. It's a nasty cycle. And that's sort of, I know people that have lived through that. And I think that that's the thing that that story really um, hammers on. And there's a lot of guilt in her because, of course, she's so guilt. She feels guilty for having this addiction and putting herself in these situations and being this kind of person that she was when she was drunk. And so she's willing to believe that, yeah, it was all me because I was this horrible drunk. And well, it's like she, you know, she even feels guilty after she figures it out. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. She feels she still feels responsible. Um, yeah. And and I think sometimes like uh, we have to carry the uncertainty of never really being able to know our role in. Mm -hmm. So if all of these things, if all of this literature, these psychological th thrillers, and even horror to some extent, are about our fears, uh, have you read the book or seen the movie The Room? Oh yeah. Okay. Both. So I. 
I focus on the the movie. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Brie Larson's in it. Her son and her are kidnapped. It's based on a real life story that happened in Germany, where where a woman was kidnapped uh, by her father and hidden, I think, in a basement for like twenty plus years. Yeah, and um. You know, there's the case in Cleveland, Ohio, where they found a bunch of women trapped in the guy's house. Castro, yeah. Castro, yeah. There was one in New York when I was a reporter in the early 2000s. And, you know, I even think of something like Stephen King and the book Misery, where he is sort of writing about himself as a writer who's trapped in a bed and, you know, a woman has captured him, controls him, is trying to force him to write. And I think about all those about being trapped, right? All those stories. What is that? What do you think the fear is there? Ooh, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, the, because I remember myself uh, as a, a young person, that was one of my biggest fears as a child was being kidnapped. Um, and I think that was also being fed a lot into our heads. I was a kid of the 80s, you know, and 90s. So we were always seeing like Unsolved Mysteries, America, America's Most Wanted, and, you know, hearing these stories about kids going missing. And then we also didn't always have the benefit of knowing what happened, whether these people were ever found or rescued yeah. or not. Now, the reality is you're much more likely to get kidnapped by your dad. But. Right. Yeah. The whole concept of parental kidnapping was completely foreign to me as a child as well. I was like, how can a parent kidnap their own kid? Like, that doesn't uh-huh. make sense. I mean, that just shows how lucky I was. I wasn't a child of divorce or anything like that. But um, but I think, yeah, that fear. Now, Stephen King's fear, I think, is so beautifully illustrated here because you know, when he was kidnapped by his number one fan. And again, this is a story that would probably never really happen, right? When you really, when you really zoom out from it, like what are the odds that you... Are you you 100% sure of that? No, I mean... Like, let's say you're you're a boss, right? Like, and you have, you know, I don't know, people within your workforce who adore you, or you do something like you're a writer, or you're a podcaster, or you are... I don't know. I'm I'm just going to make this up. You're the matriarch of the family. You kind of do get trapped by the expectations of your social relationships and oh. your social relationships. Oh, absolutely. I just mean like the plot of this story of love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are you yeah. him wiping out in a road and being rescued by the woman who is the most obsessed with him and has been for years, right? And so he he creates this again this sort of exaggerated scenario. Um, uh, but it, it works specifically because Stephen King does such a great job. And I think he did this in The Shining very well, too, where this is a man who is at a crossroads with his career and he has to make something of it. Right. And Paul Sheldon in Misery is trying to make a break from writing these sappy romance books that made him rich and famous. He wants to get back to writing the quote unquote real stories the important stories. And so he kills off Misery, his character, and he's trying to write this more masculine book about a guy who steals cars. And, you know, but then he gets kidnapped by Misery's biggest fan and forced to write. And it's sort of like that fear of being held to the expectation of an industry, of a business, of your career, of society and what they expect of you is terrifying to me, like on a professional level. I hate this idea that I have to be pigeonholed into this one thing for the rest of my life. Let me expand it though. Like, think about it like a mom, right? Yeah. Where a mom is held to the expectations of her family. Like, I I just think about a lot of the moms who um, come into my office or even women in my life who, who, who mothers and their families. And it's like, Put on the brave face. You need yes. to be strong because the kids need you right now. You need oh, yeah. to be And they're, they don't get to like be the real them. They're constantly playing this role of mom for everybody else around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, and I see that so much in older generations. Like when I think about my grandmother and how um, I watched her for so many years, my whole childhood, where she was making all the meals. And she was always the last to sit down. Every time we gathered, she was always getting up and getting things for people. She was always just looking after everybody. And we were always like, 
grandma, sit down. Let's come on. Don't get up again. <laughs> Let's eat. Um, and it's like, because that was the role. And I don't think until I would say in the last five years, she's now 95 years old and she's, she's still with us. And, um, now I think I finally see the real anime in a way that like, she probably always was, but she doesn't have to put on that performance or that show or that role anymore because her kids are all old enough to be retired themselves now. And her grandkids are my age and, you know, and, and she's now at the end of her life and finally, you know, and I like to think that I'm more privileged in that in the sense that I didn't, I wasn't held to that exact standard, but of course, you know, always there's that role of having to repress or stuff down or, or put on the, put on the smiley face, try to be the, the good mom and all that. When a lot of times when they're, especially when they're really young, you're just very depressed. You're very tired. You're very overwhelmed. And, but yet you have to get up and you got to get those kids up and you got to get them dressed and fed and off to school. Um, and sometimes the weight of that is absolutely crushing. It's so, interesting you said that held to that yeah. standard. Because if you think about misery and you think about the way that Stephen King escapes and, or <laughs> I call it Stephen King. Oh, it's him. It's him. I mean, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> And I, I wonder whether it's like really about the standards that we're holding ourselves to that what the things that we like, I've always wondered whether in misery, like the torture was really a metaphor for not being loved. Yeah. And what she was taking from him was, you know, the adoration of a fan, et cetera, et cetera, you know, based on what she's yelling about, take away the hammer and the tying to the bed and all that fun stuff. Um, and that maybe to some extent, it's really about the standards we're holding ourselves to. Oh, of course. And like with King in particular, I mean, he, he had, he had two prisoners, main ones. One was his addictions and that finds its way into so many, many of his stories. Um, and he's, he talks so openly about it. You could just see so many metaphors for addiction through so many of his stories. But also I feel that the expectation that he set for himself when he was at the peak of his fame in the eighties, when he wrote misery, um, he was being branded very specifically as a horror author. And he always hated that, um, you know, he really wanted to just be a fiction author. He wanted to be known for being able to do so many things. That's one reason why he wrote under a pseudonym, uh, Richard Bachman, um, for a number of years, because he wanted to expand beyond the horror um, landscape. And it was so hard for him to be broken out of that. It took him many years, and he's, but he still carries that label. Like he, it's still stuck to him because that's what made him famous. And so I feel like for him, like and what the, the the pressure that he set for himself um, to be able to perform as like America's leading um, horror author was a lot, and I think it probably fed his addictions, and I think it probably fed you know a lot of his work um, as well. I mean, being able to like you know be released from that in a lot of ways as he grew older and he got clean and he nearly died and after being hit by a van. I think all those things that happened to him in his later life. I think. Finally, he was able to just be like, I'm just going to write. I'm just yeah. going to well, write. One of, one of the books that I recommend to people the most uh, has nothing to do with horror or the paranormal, but his book on writing. So it's good. Amazing. It's oh, an amazing. my God. It's a tremendous. Um, I love the way it's divided between both being an autobiography of of sorts and a, and a writing guide. Writing reference manual. manual yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wanted to ask you about another one that's in the public consciousness over the summer. It was very funny because when I saw Abigail, there were two movies. I live like a stone surf from a movie theater. I can literally roll into it right now. <laughs> um, so lucky. Yeah, I know. I know. I, know. I, I live a charmed life, as I like to say. But, um, I, you know, and I was sitting, it was some Saturday. I just remember it was a Saturday because I know my Saturday routines. And I'm like sitting there talking to a friend and I'm debating Abigail or Civil War, Abigail or Civil War. I'm like, go to Civil War, dude, go to Civil War. And, you know, Civil War is this movie that's about, it's like this 
you can't tell politically which side it is, but the United States is basically fractured. The main U.S. government is clustered primarily to the East Coast. Some of the, you know, some of the Great Lakes upper Midwest is still a part of it, but most of the other country is fractured into a Florida alliance, an alliance between some of the Western states and California. And it's this giant like war that's going on, very sort of like a metaphor right now for, you know, it's very interesting how many of these authors that we're thinking about, like Margaret Atwood, the Canadian who wrote Handmaid's Tale, how many of them are outsiders looking into America. And, you know, it really speaks to our fractured times. And you can't tell in the movie, like, which side is which side politically. But it's this idea that we could fracture like that. And that got me thinking, uh, again, a lot more about and I, I, I literally went to see it. I, I don't know. I could get a hard count if I opened my Fandango app right now, but I maybe saw it in the theater five times. Wow. I barely go back to ever um, see a movie. But it does make me think of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, which came out in 1985. And, you know, it's this dystopian future novel right? And it's about a patriarchal, uh, totalitarian society created by this group called the Sons of Jacob, I think, who take over the United States government. Um, And it came out at a time where uh, a lot of people, including Atwood, believe that America post-Jimmy Carter and into the Reagan revolution, you know, like what I call the Lee Atwater days, were, was really embracing conservatism and Christian conservatism. Yes. Not just Christianity, but this Christian right political um, movement. And yeah. then, you know, in 2016, Hulu, uh, what I just thought was like fortuitous, it reminded me of the TV show Homeland, where like whatever happened on Homeland one season happened in reality the next year. And, 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 you know, they began working on, um, you know, a adaption for TV of The Handmaid's Tale just as the Trump presidency was coming around. I watched it right after Trump won and yeah. uh, trying to stab myself, you know. Over- <laughs> yes. And, and actually, for me, it was like less about Donald Trump and much more about the movement mm-hmm. that coalesced behind him, where the religious right had come together with the populace where it had come together with like the Michigan militia, like this wow. hodgepodge, like if you look at the Trump supporters in that first year, this hodgepodge, and I can't even call it conservatism, but this hodgepodge of weird set of groups came together behind yeah. these, uh, what sounded at the time like very totalitarian ideas. And, but, but some of the things that were very fascinating about Hulu is particularly in dealing with like young people I knew and, you know, people who were in their early twenties, late teens, we were having conversations after that about topics like, you know, you pick, um, women's reproductive freedom, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the role that religion should play in society that we wouldn't normally have. And while I see like, you know, Handmaid's Tale as a giant warning sign. I do think in so many ways, it's not really just about like, you know, like the, sh- the, the, the stretchy part is somebody taking over the U.S. government. Right. But the idea that those freedoms or that we could have a reversal on race, for example, yes. Or yeah. a reversal on gender equality or a reversal, not that any of those things have ever been near perfect, but that it that we could follow that mountain up and then head down is is something that I think stokes a lot of fear that people relate to in things like the handmaids so oh you- I couldn't agree more. I I felt like when I was watching that show, and I've only seen the first season, I haven't been able to like work myself up to watch any more of it because the first season follows the book pretty pretty closely and then it ends like the book ends. Um, and there was a sequel that I also read um, that came out a few years ago, I believe, um, that was pretty good. Um, but um, the scariest part of watching that show for me 
was actually the, one of the flashback scenes when it was still mu- much like m- the society that we know uh, today. And the main character and her girlfriend are sitting in a restaurant eating and they go to pay with their credit cards and the credit cards don't work anymore. Yep. And that for me, and all of a sudden they start hearing things outside, but that for me was like the coldest, most chilling moment as a woman or as anybody who um, had to fight for a certain right that a lot of people take for granted. And it was that women were cut off from the financial system, right? Yeah, yeah. And that like how that can just happen. Like one minute you're just living your normal life and the next the theocrats have won. And there are there have been moments in our lives since then that have kind of like had that sort of not the exact gut punch, but it's like, oh my God, are we getting closer to that moment? Um, that has been truly scary. Um, you know, just uh, certain decisions handed down by the court and whatnot. And uh, that feeling of like, I love how we're talking about different fears in each of these stories um, that we're discussing here, because the fear for me is that that fear of the giant like sea change of society that normally, especially in the United States, I feel like the system that we have built in this country is namely built to remain stable. Like we have built stability into our system. So it's very hard to change. That's why even four years of Donald Trump did not undo as much as it could have, because our system has so many weird, like Byzantine, like confusing, you know, tunnels and like avenues. You can't just do anything. And then in the United States government, it is a, it is a very slow, creaky machine. (laughs) And so, and that serves us in a lot of ways. It makes it so that Stuff like that can't just happen um, normally, though I, I haven't seen Civil War yet. I'm working myself up to that one as well, because it sounds like it paints a pretty realistic picture of how that could happen um, in today's United States. And I feel like that taps into that great existential horror of things that are well beyond our control that aren't like a natural phenomenon of like a hurricane or something like that. Like by our own creation, we have managed to undo this great, complex society that we have built. And I think that that is something that I feel like we're always on the, we're being forced to be afraid of in a lot of ways, because it's like we got a 24-hour media cycle now, and it's it's just, it's always there. And we have social media feeding into those fears as well. Um, So I feel like that's a fear that lives, I think, a little more closely to the surface for a lot of people in 2024 um, than more so than maybe even 1985, because we're seeing it so much now. Yeah. Yeah. I am one of the uh, things I was thinking about as we get sort of to the close, you started a new podcast called Vintage Villains, which looks at historical crimes it's sort of like true crime meets history Mm -hmm. um you know and really sort of like tells the societal issues what the zeitgeist is during the time it's 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 a deeper sort of like historical 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 take on things and you know in this conversation about psychological thrillers just like history is for us like if we're talking about history of the holocaust or history of all sorts of different events Mm-hmm. I'm wondering whether, like, the common thread there is that th- these psychological thrillers, like whether it's Gone Girl and it's about being authentic, or it's something like The Handmaid's Tale and it's about guarding your rights, or if it's about something like control, like we were talking about, or or depending on relationships and misery, that all these psychological thrillers may just be warning signs in a way that we can actually accept the warning signs because they're taken to such an extreme they become yeah. thrilling but in reality the writers have built warnings in for us oh yeah oh yeah i mean i wanted to do vintage villains be- specifically because i wanted i'm always like seeking the the genesis or i'm seeking the the sort of root 
cause. And the funny thing is I'll never find it because it's like, as soon as you think you found it, you're going to, you just keep digging and you're going to find, you know, more like why, why did, how did we end up here? You got to crawl back and find the context or find the event that led to the event that led to the event and so on and so forth. And you can do that through all of human history. And I find that uh, exploring these stories, these real stories of, of, uh, you know, history and like these terrible people or the things that they've done or, um, you know, their terrible actions from maybe not the worst people or whatever is like, um, you can kind of see where we get these stories. I, I do feel like art imitates life. I really do feel that um, we, you know, writers tend to reflect a lot of what's around them. I think we're just giant mirrors um, of different shapes. And, mm. you know, and I feel like Maybe doing vintage it's easier, films, you know, it's, it's, easier, yeah. it's easier to look at through a historical lens where it feels different or a distorted lens, like in a psychological thriller where, like I'm looking in that mirror and it's not really me, but it is me. Like, yeah. me, like in thinking about like how hard it is when people give you direct feedback that the, these, both these things, both history and psychological thrillers are a way that we can accept indirect feedback. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love to like the perspective that it gives me. I feel a weird comfort in knowing in discovering over and over again that we have always been kind of messed up like this, you know, like, like the things that we're looking at right now in 2024 as, you know, terrifying or they feel very new and they feel very urgent and they feel like, uh, you know, we've never unprecedented. That's a word we hear so much, but it, so few things really are. Because when you climb through the portal and look through to back in time, uh, and you see those people that lived 100, 200, 300 years ago, and you find that, oh my God, they were fighting about this same stuff then too. Or they were having very similar fights and they were having very similar things. And it's like, sometimes we feel like we're on this precipice and that we're about to go over the edge or that this is it. And then you just realize that all, all of humanity has been having a lot of the same discussions and a lot of the same fears mm. and uh, being able to reach back through time and, and touch that stuff is almost like just kind of having like communing with the spirits in, in a way and just going out like, okay, or you, you had your time on this planet. I'm going to have my time on this planet. Hopefully I'm contributing something that somebody 30, 40, 50 years or hundred years from now can look back on and go, oh, okay. She went through that too. Um, we're all in this together, man. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, no matter when and no matter where, um, we're just people on this rock trying to figure it out and messing up a lot. <laughs> and having fun along the way. Yeah. So yeah. I'll go ahead and end on that now. But, um, and as always, thanks for coming on. And I'm looking forward to having you on again. Oh, it's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. If you would like to join us for more discussions with me and other listeners, we can be found on most social media platforms, including a listener-run Facebook group called the Silver Linings Fireside Chat. For ad-free early episodes and deeper conversations with our guests and live conversations with other listeners, you can also join us on our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the Silver Linings Handbook. I'm Jason Blair, and this is the Silver Linings Handbook Podcast. We'll see you all again next week.